the time. Glad you're here today. What a great time in God's house. It's always exciting to be able to get together with His people and, and worship Him. And uh, we're blessed with such a great worship team. Uh, we thank God for them. Amen. You want to give them a hand? Just thank them for giving themselves away that way. We're in our series called Miracle Worker, and we've been talking about whenever we really need a miracle. And today we're going to look at uh, a miracle, but actually we're going to look at it today uh, in a different way. Because God sometimes not only uses miracles to change people's lives, but He uses miracles to teach us lessons. And so today we're going to look at uh, three different things. We're going to look at a misunderstanding between Jesus and the disciples. We're going to look at a miracle, and then we're going to look at the message from the miracle. And uh, we'll see what God has to teach us today about miracles and about sight. And that's the name of the message today. It's, the message is called Sight. In Scripture, um, sight and blindness many times is used as a metaphor for a closed mind, a spiritually closed mind. And that's what we're going to look at today. Because a lot of people ask me, they say, Keith, look, I, need, I really don't understand what's going on. I'm really kind of in the dark. There are a lot of things happening in my life right now, and I can't seem to figure it all out. And I really need wisdom. Well, what they're asking for uh, whenever they ask for wisdom is really to understand life from God's perspective. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom is really understanding how to look at life from God's perspective. And a lot of times we don't understand what's going on because we are spiritually blind. We're spiritually closed-minded. And we're not looking at things from God's perspective. And so God takes this misunderstanding with the disciples, with His disciples, and He takes a message and He teaches them how to have the right perspective and how to have their spiritual eyes open and how to gain wisdom. The Bible tells us in Matthew 6, 22, that the eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And so learning to see life from God's uh, viewpoint is called wisdom, and that's what we're looking for. So let me give you a little history about the misunderstanding. Jesus had just finished a couple of miracles, and we're in the book of Matthew, chapter 8. He had just finished feeding 5,000 people with some fish, and he finished feeding 4,000 people. And he had this miracle. And after the miracle, after he worked the miracle, the Pharisees, which were the religious big shots, they started asking Jesus questions, and they started trying to pin him down about different things. And really, Jesus didn't have time for religious big shots. And so Jesus and the disciples got in a boat, and they were headed to the other side of the lake. While they were in the boat, there was a question. There was a, and, and the disciples had this question, and, and here's how things went. The Bible says, then Jesus got into a boat, Matthew 8, 13. Then Jesus got into a boat and crossed over to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for the loaf that they had in the boat, which was probably pretty ragged. I would think a loaf of bread hanging out in a boat, probably not so good. <laughs> Maybe fish bait, I don't know. So well, that's all they had in the boat. And then Jesus said, be careful, Jesus warned. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And the disciples discussed why Jesus had said this, and they decided it was because they had brought bread with them. And so here's the misunderstanding. Jesus was teaching them a metaphor for life, and they were looking at it as a question for the moment. So Jesus said, watch out for leaven and uh, for yeast. And it takes just a little bit of yeast because a little yeast goes a long way. And he said, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. And he was talking about their pride. And the disciples didn't understand. They started talking amongst themselves, and they said, he must be... He must be trying to pin us down because we forgot to bring something to eat. You see, they were thinking about lunch. They weren't thinking about a lesson. And I think a lot of times we're spiritually closed-minded because we're focused on the lunch, on the immediate, and not focused on what God is really trying to teach us. And so Jesus is going to teach them a lesson. And the Bible says, now it's, it's really like having a fight with an unarmed man, Jesus dealing with the disciples because they were kind of dull and Jesus was omniscient. He knows everything, knew their thoughts. And so the Bible says that aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you not still see or understand? So Jesus is saying, here's the problem. I'm trying to teach you a spiritual lesson, but you don't get it. Uh, you don't understand what I'm trying to do. And, and I think a lot of times whenever we're seeking wisdom, whenever we don't know what to do, whenever we're spiritually blind, 
That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, don't you, don't you get it yet? And that's what he was telling his guys. You've seen what I can do. You've been with me. You've touched me. You've witnessed me. Uh, me. You, you've ministered with me, and you still don't get it. Uh, then he goes on to say this. And your minds are what? Closed. So they were spiritually blind. Your minds are closed. You have eyes, but you don't really see. You have ears, but you really don't hear. Remember when I divided the loaves, and he's reminding them what he had done, of bread for the 5,000. How many baskets did we have uh, with food? And they said 12. And when I divided the seven loaves of bread for the 4,000, how many baskets did we fill with the leftover pieces of food? And they said seven. And then Jesus said, and you still don't understand yet. So Jesus was making the point that I'm not talking about physical food here. And here's what I want you to understand from this story, is that every miracle has a message. Every time God does a miracle, there is a message in it. There is something that we can learn. See, we get so focused on God, fix me, heal me, change me, fix the bank account, fix relationships, fix this, do this, that we forget in the miracle is a message. And whenever we start to understand that and look at things from God's perspective, our minds will become open. Our eyes will start to open. We'll start to see the spiritual truth that God has for us. The second thing is that blindness is a metaphor for a closed mind. So why can't we see? What are the things that we see that, from this story that cause spiritual blindness? First thing is this. The first thing I would write in the first blank, and I know you've all got your outlines, pens ready to go. <laughs> write down this. The first reason that I can't see that I'm spiritually closed-minded is because of pride. Pride will cause me to have a closed mind. Pride will cause me to have a closed mind. That was what he was telling them about the Pharisees. He said, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. What does yeast do? Did anybody ever watch uh, I Love Lucy? Because, yeah, I, now there's some people that are so young they don't even know who Lucy is. <laughs> but Deb and I, now we're Lucy fans. And there was an episode where Lucy and Ethel were going to make some bread. Did y'all remember that episode? They poured the whole box of yeast in there, and they had a loaf of bread that was about as big as Manhattan. I mean, it was huge. And that's, what it, that's what yeast does. It just takes a little bit, and it goes a long way. It permeates everything, and it causes it to puff up. And it blows things out of proportion. And so many times we have spiritually closed minds because of the pride that we have, because pride puffs us up, and it causes us to blow things out of proportion. You ever get into an argument with your spouse? Yeah, that's an amen or an oh me, right? Yeah, you have. You have. And I found that many times the reason that Deb and I argue, and we do have arguments, we, we've been married for 35 years, and so we're way past the discussion stage. <laughs> We've grown past that. We have arguments. A lot of times these arguments are hard to resolve because I have a little pride. And pride puffs up, and pride causes us to be closed-minded, and pride causes us to be arrogant. Pride causes spiritual blindness. So one of the first reasons that we're spiritually closed-minded is because of pride. And that's why Jesus was warning the disciples, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. Their problem was pride. Jesus came to fulfill Scripture, and they were so prideful they were so proud that they, they were so proud of the law, so proud of their religion that they were closed-minded to what Jesus was doing. And uh, so the second thing is that causes us to be spiritually blind is short-term thinking. Short-term thinking. Whenever we're only focused on today, when we're only focused on the moment, when we're only focused on the crisis, when we're only focused on the problem and what's going on right now, it causes us to miss what Jesus is really trying to teach us. It says, he said that the dis disciples discussed why Jesus had said this, and they decided that they hadn't brought anything, any bread with them. They were more interested in something to eat than what Jesus wanted to teach them. They were more interested in lunch, in lunch than a lesson. Short-term thinking focuses on things that God has not done rather than the lessons and the things that He is doing right now. Whenever we start thinking about immediate gratification, taking care of the immediate need, God, why aren't you fixing this problem? You ever have that thought? 
You ever you need a miracle? You need you need God to open your eyes. You can't see what's going on. You don't have the wisdom that you want. You're praying for wisdom, but you want God to fix it now. God, I want I want something to eat now. They said, well, obviously it's because we didn't bring any food. They were so focused on their hunger pain that they were missing what Jesus was really trying to teach them. Jesus had a lesson for life. They wanted something for lunch. So many times we're spiritually blind because we're looking for the wrong thing. We were looking for that. We have that short-term thinking. And then the third thing is short-term memory. Short-term memory. Whenever we don't remember the blessings of God and the miracles that God has already done in our life, then it causes us to focus on the wrong thing. Jesus reminded them, look, I fed. Look, don't you remember, guys? I mean, we were there together. And he said, I had some fish and some bread, and I broke it up, and I gave it, and we fed 5,000 people, and how much was left over? They said 12 baskets. And he said, and then we had 4,000, and we had a little bit of bread. What do we do? We fed them all. Jesus said, don't. I mean, can't you imagine? Put yourself in Jesus' shoes in that boat. I'm thinking, man, they're worried that he can't feed 12 of them. And so, so, so many times we have closed minds and we're spiritually blind because we have short-term memories. We forget what Jesus can do. We forget what Jesus has done. Short-term memory causes us to worry, and it distorts what God is really up to. The Bible says that they came to Bethsaida, and some of the people brought a blind man to him and begged Jesus to touch him. And Jesus took the blind man in his hand, and he led him outside the village. Now, on farther down, 825, Matthew 825, I mean, I'm sorry, did I tell you guys Matthew? Get in Mark. If you're having trouble following, <laughs> might need to flip over to Mark. That'll help you. Mark 8. So here's the misunderstanding. Jesus has a spiritual lesson. He's trying to teach them a spiritual lesson. And they are spiritually closed. Their mind is spiritually closed. They're spiritually blind. Their, their sight is foggy, muddy, gray. They can't make it out. And so Jesus is going to take a blind man and he's going to teach them a lesson with this miracle. So the Bible says that when they got there that he took this blind man, that people brought this blind man to him and to touch him. And Jesus took the blind man by the hand and he led him outside the village. Now, there are three conditions that we see for a miracle. One is that someone cares enough. Someone cares enough. Someone cared enough to bring this blind man to Jesus. Someone cared enough to bring a guy to Jesus that couldn't bring himself. We talk all the time about building bridges, that we're building bridges, building bridges, building bridges. What are we building bridges to? We're bu building bridges to people that don't know Jesus. That's what we're doing. That's what we teach. That's what we want you to do, is build a bridge to someone that doesn't know Jesus. See, if we're going to be a part of a miracle, then we've got to care enough. If you want a miracle, you've got to care enough. Whenever you pray for someone, whenever you know someone that is hurting, you know someone that is struggling at their job, you know someone that doesn't know Jesus, when you know someone whose health is failing, when you know someone that's having a problem, and you stop thinking about yourself long enough to lift them up in prayer, that's called intercession. And we need to be a church of intercessory prayer warriors. We need to be praying for each other. We need to be caring enough for someone else that we want God to work a miracle in their life, that we want God to do something, and we care enough, we get on our knees enough, we invest enough, we bring them to Jesus. The second thing that I see about a miracle, if God is going to work a miracle, is not only do we need to, someone needs to care enough to bring them to Jesus, you got to be close enough to Jesus. Jesus touched him, took him by the hand. See, it's not good enough to know Jesus from a distance. You need to get to know Jesus. I mean, if we really are serious about a miracle in our life, we can't read about Jesus in a book and think, man, that's really amazing story. I mean, he was really something else. Wow, he was so wise and he was so powerful and he was so gracious and he was so kind and he was so loving and we read about him in scripture but we don't pull up close to him and embrace him. 
See, if we really want a miracle, we've got to get close enough to Jesus to know who he is. We've got to let him touch our lives. We've got to let him get inside of us and change us. We've got to let him save us. We've got to let Jesus heal us. And not only do we have to get close enough, not only does someone need to care enough to intercede, not only do we need to get close enough to touch him, but we've got to trust him with our lives. We've got to trust him enough to follow him. The Bible says that the blind man didn't know Jesus, had no idea who he was, what he was about, but Jesus took him by the hand. And the blind man followed Jesus. He trusted Jesus. He trusted that Jesus wasn't going to lead him into a ditch. He trusted that Jesus was going to do something for him. And Jesus took him and, and he led him outside of town to perform this miracle. You see, I think that whenever we trust Christ enough, whenever we're being interceded for and we get close to him and we trust him enough, then I think that we're getting ready for a miracle. And Jesus was about to do a miracle in this man's life. And I'm going to tell you, the way that he did this is kind of gross. Have you ever thought, that Jesus, have you ever thought of Jesus in those terms that he would do something gross? As a matter of fact, if we did it today, we might get locked up because of the way that he healed this blind guy. The Bible says in Mark 8, 23, then Jesus spit in the man's eyes. I don't know, am I the only one who thinks that's a little weird? Well, I know that Jesus has a lesson in every miracle, but I'm not sure. I mean, I, that's one of the things on the list that I, I'm going to ask when I get to heaven is, Jesus, you could have healed him any way you wanted to. You could have just said, be healed. As a matter of fact, Jesus could have thought, be healed. And he would have immediately received his sight. But Jesus took this blind man by the hand. And you know what's interesting to me is that Jesus never had uh, like healing rallies. You ever notice that? Did you ever notice that whenever we get so excited about miracles and people going to these get healed and rallies and things, and, but every time that Jesus worked a miracle, it was almost like it was an inconvenience. Like he was on his way to do something else and somebody came to him and said, I need help. And he didn't have, you know, he didn't set up the stadium, didn't go to the Coliseum and say, I'll, I'll bring all the sick people here, I'm going to heal them all. Jesus always healed people on the way to do something else. That's interesting to me. And so here's this guy, and the Bible says that Jesus spit in the dude's eye. I think there's a country song. I don't know if it says something like that, but I guess, it's, I guess it's scriptural. I don't know. But anyway, he spit in his eye, and he said, and he put his hands on him, and then he asked, do you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. And here's another thing about this miracle is not only did Jesus spit in his eye, but it was a progressive miracle. Why would Jesus heal this guy's eyesight progressively? Because he is God and he is the miracle worker. And we've seen him raise, he raised people from the dead for crying out loud. Why did Jesus feel it necessary to heal this man in steps? It's because there's a message in the miracle. There's a message in the miracle. He said, do you see anything? He said, uh, I see people walking around, but they look like trees walking around. The older I get, the more I understand what he's talking about. Because, I, I, because if, you, if you wear glasses and then you take them off, sometimes it just looks like things moving around out there. You really can't make it out. And he said, they look like trees walking around. So Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes a second time. And then he said, the Bible says that his eyes were opened fully and his sight was restored completely. And he saw everything clearly. And then Jesus sent him home saying, don't go back into town. So Jesus healed him completely. Three lessons from this healing and seeing things clearly. Number one, my spiritual vision grows in seasons. My spiritual vision grows in seasons. We want wisdom. We want spiritual wisdom. We want spiritual sight. And Jesus is illustrating with this healing how that works in our spiritual life. See, we want to be able to see, but we can't do it unless Jesus touches us. And whenever he does touch us and we have a relationship with him, we don't instantly have the vision that we desire. 
I remember whenever I first became a Christian, there were so many things that I didn't understand, and God grew me and changed me a step at a time. And I would say to you, listen, if you want spiritual wisdom, if you want your eyesight to be open and to be able to see things clearly, to understand life clearly, to have the wisdom that God wants, then take it in phases, take it in steps. Let God change you. As you grow, God will bring more revelation. You'll understand more about what's going on in your life. You'll understand more about how you should react. You'll understand more about the way God wants you to live, God will increase your wisdom as you trust Him and as you grow. So Jesus healed him, and He could have healed him just like that, but He spit in His eye, and the guy's sight was restored, but it was a little blurry at first. The second thing that I see here is the test of our vision is how we see others. How is your spiritual vision? How's your spiritual vision? The test, the acid test for your spiritual vision is how you see others. It's about relationships. It's about how we love one another. And so how do you see your spouse? Are you, the test of your vision is how we see each other. The Bible says that we ought to love each other. The Bible says that the greatest thing that we can do is love each other. The Bible tells us that the best way for us to demonstrate Christ to a lost and dying world is to love each other. And I wonder, do we love each other? That's the acid test of your sight. That's the acid test of your spirituality. It's not how many times you go to church, and it's not how much money you give, and it's not the Sunday school classes that you teach, and it's not how loud you sing, and it's not all those things. The, the real test of your spiritual sight is how do you view people? Do you see them as an opportunity to share Jesus' love, or do you see them as an inconvenience? Are they competition? Is it someone to fight with? I don't know, but how do you see people? That's the test you ought to ask. You ought to, you ought to put yourself to the test. The guy opened his eyes, and he's blurry, and he said, well, I see people, but they're a little blurry. Jesus' work wasn't done. And I would say to you, listen, if you are looking at people and you see them and you don't see them in the love of Christ and you see them as a challenge or an issue or a problem or a nuisance or somebody that you just don't like, then Jesus is still working on your sight. Jesus is still working on your sight. You want spiritual wisdom? You want spiritual sight? You don't want to be spiritually blind anymore? then learn to see people the way that Jesus sees people. And when He heals our sight, He heals it in three ways. The first thing that I see is that His blindness was ended. Whenever Jesus hears our spirit, heals our spiritual blindness, He gives us sight. We become saved. We become spiritual. We start following Him, and it gives us sharp and focused. Listen to what happened here. The Bible says, uh, that then the third time that his eyes were opened fully, that his sight was restored completely and he saw everything clearly. Whenever the Bible says here that his eyes were opened fully, the translation for that is that he had intense focus. Isn't that amazing? That whenever his eye was, eyesight was given back, it wasn't that he just blinked and, hey, everything's good. It's, it it talks, speaks really of him staring intently on Jesus. And I think that whenever Jesus heals our sight, whenever He performs that miracle in our life, what He's trying to get us to do is to see Him clearly. He will sharpen our focus. He'll let us know what we're supposed to be doing. He'll give us purpose for our life. So He sharpens our focus. Not only does that, but He, uh, he helps us to see the big picture. He expands our perspective. He was fully aware now of everything that was going on. This blind man that couldn't see, that was led around by someone else, put his faith and trust in Jesus. Jesus led him outside of the town. Jesus spit in his eye. His eyes were open, and Jesus healed him, and he started to see things clearly, and he completely understood what was going on in his surrounding. And I would tell you that as you follow Jesus and become obedient and let him heal you, you'll see the big picture. Whenever Jesus restores our spiritual sight, you start to see what's really going on and what really is important. Now, I just want to tell you, a lot of the things that we think are important are not important. I don't know if you're aware of that, but a lot of the stuff that we think is the big issues are not big issues. The big stuff is really not all that big when it's compared to what Jesus has for us as His children. God has saved you. God has changed you. God has given you a purpose for living a reason for being. 
There's a reason that we come to this place. There's a reason that we worship. That reason is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. And whenever He heals our seeing and He gives us expanded perspective, we understand that everything that we do has eternal consequence. There is nothing... I want you to get your mind around this because it's amazing to me that there is nothing that I can do for the kingdom that is wasted. Nothing that I can do for the kingdom that is wasted. Does that, does that sink in? I mean, there are a lot of things that I do that are not for the kingdom that really are wasted. They, it's not going to make any difference 50 years from now if my grass in the backyard is green. Nobody's going to care. Nothing? That's nothing? But everything that I do, every seed that I plant, every kind word, every time I love someone unselfishly, every time I give, every time I serve, if, if I pick up trash in the parking lot, if I clean the bathrooms, if I pat someone on the back and tell them that I love them, if I pray for someone and intercede, whatever it is, anything that I do for the kingdom is used for the kingdom. He's 100% efficient. He uses everything that we offer him. In large perspective, why are you here? Why do you do what you do? Whenever Jesus heals us, he enlarges our perspective, and then everything comes into focus. Job said this when he was going through everything that he went through. Job said, teach me what I cannot see. What a prayer. What a prayer for the believer. Teach me, Lord, what I cannot see. Can we say that together? Would you be willing to pray that prayer to the Father? Teach me what I cannot see. Let's say it together. Come on. You can do it. We, let's, let's, do, let's do this. Let's say this to Jesus. Teach me what I cannot see. Is that a prayer that you would be willing to say? God, teach me what I can't see. Reveal to me the things that I need to know. Increase my understanding. Increase my perspective. Heal my sight. Everything comes into focus. We have spiritual understanding. Teach me what I cannot see. If I've done wrong, I won't do it again, said Job. So Jesus had a misunderstanding with the disciples. Jesus worked a miracle to teach them a lesson. And Jesus asked them a defining question. Mark 8, 27. Then Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked them, Who do people say that I am? And they replied, Some say that you're John the Baptist. And the only problem with that statement was that John the Baptist had had his head cut off. And others say that you're Elijah. Now, we talked about Elijah last week. Elijah was born about 900 years before. And still others say that you're other prophets. And I think that sometimes it's easy, easier for people to say that Jesus was someone that lived some 900 years before or had his head cut off or some crazy thing than to admit who he really is. Jesus said, what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are God. You came to deliver us, and he got it right. See, I would say to you that that clarifying question is the most important thing that you can ask yourself this morning. See, we need a miracle. We need the blinders to be pulled off of our eyes. And if we'll come to a place where we say, Jesus, you are the Christ. We're not saying, Jesus, you're a great rabbi. Jesus, you're a great teacher. Jesus, you're a great man. We're saying, Jesus, you are God. You are my Savior. You are the Messiah. And whenever we answer that question, everything else comes into focus. Because how I see Jesus determines how clearly I see everything else. How I see Jesus determines how clearly I see everything else. 
Because if we don't see Jesus as God, if we don't see him as the Christ, if we don't see him as the Messiah, then our vision is cloudy. If we don't understand who he is, then we have no spiritual vision. If we don't understand that he came to deliver us, to sacrifice for us, to ransom us, to redeem us, then we will be blind for eternity and we'll spend eternity separated from him. The most important thing that you can ask yourself today is that question. Who do I say that Jesus is? If you say that Jesus is anything other than the Son of God, God in the flesh, come to live and die and be resurrected, then you've got the answer wrong and you'll be blind. But Jesus wants you to have your sight. And because of the resurrection, because the tomb is empty, because we can go to that place in Israel where he's supposed to be buried and he is not there, we know that everything that he said is true. The resurrection is the power that gives us our sight. So who do you say Jesus is? You want wisdom? You want a miracle? You want spiritual sight? Then put your trust in Christ.